Hello, I'm Elliot Margulies. I'm with the Mid Peninsula Community Media Center. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay, good. So let's see, is there anybody from a book group here tonight? Raise your hand if you're from a book group. Let's give some love to the book group people. I see some, some folks I know. And is there anybody who considers themselves a lover of libraries in this? I mean, you can't find anybody who won't, who won't say that. I came to Palo Alto in 1986, and my library has been the Mitchell Park Library <laughs> since I got here. And I've always been very proud that the Mitchell Park Library has such an amazing commitment to uh, new immigrants and uh, diversity, and they have this rich collection of films and books in Spanish and Chinese and Russian. And so it wasn't that surprising when I went and approached them and they said, yes, we will definitely co-sponsor an event that features an author who writes about immigration. And uh, so when I told them that we got No Violet Bulawayo to agree to our invitation, they were thrilled. And when I mentioned it to the folks at Kepler's bookstore, you could hear the gasps behind the counter. Where's, <laughs> where's our Kepler's person? Yeah. Uh, and they were saying, you got no Violet for the wild. She's our favorite new author. Sign us up. So that part was very easy. And um, uh, the media center itself has been interested in immigration stories for quite some time. And our latest project is called Made into America. And you can see some excerpts on these panels. And what did we do sponsor some events like this, and we're having another storytelling salon this summer. And our centerpiece is a website where we collect immigration stories from all sorts of families throughout the Silicon Valley about somebody in their family who came to America at any point in the US history and from any country of origin. So I, how many people here know of someone in their family who first came to the United States? Raise your hand. Al almost everyone has an immigration story. There's no us and them when it comes to immigration. And how many people in this room actually immigrated to the country themselves? Wow. So we got about a third of you that have a story that's very fresh. So I'm going to ask you uh, if you're willing to share your story on our archive. We have two clipboards over there on that table. Before you leave, sign one with your email. We'll contact you and either do an interview with you or help you write your story on our website because it's becoming a wonderful tool for students in history classes and it's soon going to be an exhibit in the libraries, a traveling exhibit through many libraries, we hope. So that said, I just want to tell you, it was such an honor to meet No Violet Bulawayo after I'd read her book. Because as some of you have already discovered, she has this incredibly genuine voice that brings insight and that brings entertainment also whether she's writing about a 10-year-old with her posse in Zimbabwe stealing guavas from richer neighbors, to uh, watching internet porn with her new immigrant friends, I mean her new American friends when after she immigrates, to being a sister of immigrants from every corner of the globe who are trying to get a foothold in this country. And while we are really proud to have No Violet be a uh, resident of the Bay Area, and we hope that she makes it her new home for many, many years, we also know from what she writes that it's not so easy to adopt a new home. And it's not so easy to encompass one identity that, that embraces these radically different worlds that she's lived in. So you'll hear more from her about all that. I just want to thank uh, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, the Palo Alto Weekly, 
the uh, Palo Alto Library, of course, uh, the Friends of the, Public, of the Palo Alto Library, and uh, Kepler's for all making this event possible. And of course, our honored guest. And without further ado, I wanna bring up Lori Hastings, a senior librarian from the great Mitchell Park Library <laughs> to introduce our guest of honor. Thank you, Elliot. The library is very pleased to be working on this project with the, um, with the Mid Peninsula Media Center and uh, on this shared um, mission we have of ours of bringing community together and, and uh, telling stories and, and learning about other people in other worlds. So I am going to give you, oh, we're almost there, we're almost at No Violet, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background first. Um, no Violet Bulawayo, the author we will be meeting this evening, was born and raised in Zimbabwe. She earned her MFA at Cornell University in 2010, where she was the recipient of the Truman Capote Fellowship and most recently, a lecturer of English. She is currently based in Oakland and is a Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. Ms. Bulawayo was awarded the 2011 Kane Prize for African Writing, described as Africa's leading literary award for her short story entitled Hitting Budapest. This story appeared in the November-December 2010 edition of the Boston Review. Upon oh. announcing her prize at the Bodleian Library in Oxford, Author Hisham Matar, the chair of judges, made the following comment about her story, and I quote, the language of hitting Budapest crackles. Here we encounter darling, bastard, cheapo, God knows, Stina, and Spo, a gang reminiscent of Clockwork Orange. But these are children, poor and violated and hungry. This is a story with moral power and weight. It has the artistry to refrain from moral commentary. No Violet Buolueo is a writer who takes delight in language. No Violet's debut novel, We Need New Names, which is on the table over here, was published in 2013. It has been recognized with the LA Times Book Prize Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction, the Penn Hemingway Award, the Atizalat Prize for Literature, the Barnes and Noble Discover Award, second place, and the National Book Foundation Five Under 35 Fiction Selection. We Need New Names was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and the Guardian First Book Award and selected to the New York Times Notable, Notable Books of 2013 list, the Barnes and Noble, Noble Discover Great New Writers list, and others. No Violet adapted her story, Hitting Budapest, as the first chapter of We Need New Names. Here again, we meet Darling and her friends as they struggle to survive in a Zimbabwean shantytown called Paradise. When Darling is given the opportunity to move to the US to live with her aunt, she faces a new challenge, how to transition from abject poverty, the abject poverty of paradise, to the ostentatious excess of America. The New York Times wrote of, of a No Violet's novel, quote, a deeply felt and fiercely written debut novel. The San Francisco Chronicle wrote, the novel deftly defamiliarizes the familiar through Darling's vibrant and inventive language. Bulueo's language is always alive. <clears throat> we encourage everyone to read the book if you have not done so already. No Violet will stay afterwards, and uh, if you purchase copies or if you have a copy of the book with you, she's going to sit there and, and, and sign her book. And we invite everyone to join us uh, for a librarian-moderated book discussion about We new, Need no, New Names. We're gonna give you about a month to read the book. The discussion will be here, right here in Lucy Stern on June 4th at seven o'clock, next door in the fireside room. And if you'd like to sign up for that book discussion, we have some sign-up sheets on the table, or you can do it on the library's webpage. <clears throat> Light refreshments will be served. 
Um, and if you're not able to attend on June 4th, you are invited to participate in an online discussion of the book. This online discussion can be found on the Made Into America website uh, under madeintoamerica.org in the discussion session. So thank you for being so patient. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you our upcoming young author, No Violet Bulawayo. Thank you for that um, wonderful introduction, and thank you all for coming out this evening. It's a, it's a wonderful crowd, and I know you had other things to do, so I appreciate your, your presence. Um, we Need New Names is set both in and outside of the U.S. The, the first half is set in an unnamed country, but we all know it's, it's Zimbabwe. I just didn't want to name it. So I will read the first section. Um, the book is set in a shanty town called Paradise, which was inspired by uh, me wanting to sort of find out what happened. Uh, maybe I should backtrack a little bit. Sometime in 2005, the Zimbabwean government having faced the, its first serious opposition since it came to power in 1980. It came to power just before I was born. Retaliated by bulldozing people's homes in informal settlements. I was already living in the US and uh, of course I was following what was happening at home through, through the media. And one of the most heartbreaking pictures I saw was of this kid who was sitting on top of his bulldozed home. Um, and so it became an obsession of mine to find out what was going to happen to those people who were rendered homeless, and I created Paradise. So this uh, section sort of explains how the people come to Paradise. They did not come to Paradise. Coming would mean that they were choosers that they first looked at the sun, sat down with crossed legs, picked their teeth and pondered the decision. That they had the time to gaze at their reflections in long mirrors, perhaps pet their hair, tighten their belts, check the watches on their wrists before looking at the red road and finally announcing, now we are ready for this. They did not come, no, they just appeared. They appeared one by one, two by two, three by three. They appeared single file, like ants, in swarms, like flies, in angry waves, like a wretched sea. They appeared in the early morning, in the afternoon, in the dead of night. They appeared with the dust from their crushed houses clinging to their hair and skin and clothes, making them appear like things from another life. Swollen ankles and blisters under their feet, they appeared fatigued by the long walk. They appeared carrying sticks with which they marked the ground for where a shake would begin and end. And these they carefully passed around partitioning the new land with hands shaking like they were killing something. Squatting to mark the ground like that, they appeared broken, shards of glass people. They appeared with tin, with cardboard, with plastic, with nails and other things with which to build. And they tried to appear calm as they put up their shakes, nailing tin on tin, piece by piece, bravely looking up at the sky and trying to tell themselves and one another that even here, in this strange new place, the sky was still the same familiar blue, a sign things would work out for them. Some appeared with children in their arms. There were many who appeared with children held by the hands. The children themselves appeared baffled 
they did not understand what was happening to them. And the parents held their children close to their chests and caressed their dusty, unkempt heads with hardened palms, appearing to console them, but really they did not quite know what to say. Gradually, the children gave up and ceased asking questions and just appeared empty, almost, like their childhood had fled and left only the bones of his shadow behind. Generally, the men always tried to appear strong. They walked tall, heads upright, arms steady at the side, and feet firmly planted like trees, solid Jericho walls of men. But when they went out in the bush to relieve themselves and nobody was looking, they fell apart like cr crumbling towers and wept with the wretched grief of forgotten concubines. And when they returned to the presence of their women and children and everybody else, they stuck hands deep inside torn pockets until they felt their dry thighs, kicked little stones out of the way and erected themselves like walls again. But then the women, who knew all the ways of weeping and all there was to know about falling apart, would not be deceived. They gently rose from the earth, beat dust off their skirts, and planted themselves like rocks in front of their men and children and sheikhs. And only then did all appear almost tolerable. So we fast forward to the US section and follow my protagonist, Tulling. Uh, she's lucky enough to have an aunt who's able to, to have her come over. So one afternoon, they are just hanging out. Aunt Fostalina, I say, trying to get her attention but her head stays glued to the magazine. These days, the magazines have replaced working out because Aunt Fostalina doesn't have the energy since she's so busy with her two jobs, one at the hospital and one at the nursing home. The reason she's working hard like this is so she can finish paying for the house she just bought for mother and mother of bones in Budapest. I've seen the pictures. It's a nice big house with a pool, just like the other houses we used to heat for guavas. The house is even nicer than this one we live in here in America, which I find strange because when I was at home, I heard that everything in America was better. Every once in a while, Aunt Fostalina glances up from her magazine at the TV. At that woman whose pretty face looks like something is wrong with it talking about how to lose 10 pounds in 10 days and telling people to call now and change their lives. I'll just go maybe for two weeks and then I'll come back, I say, even though Aunt Fostalina is still ignoring me. Darling, it's not time yet. When that time comes, you'll go, she finally says and flips another page. But you said once that when I turned 14, Child, it's not like your father is Obama and he is the Air Force One. Going home costs money. Besides, you came on a visitor's visa and that's expired. You get out, you kiss this America bye-bye, and -bye, Fostalina says. But why can't I come back? I can just renew my visa, I say. Darling, leave me alone. Do I look like the immigration to you, she says. She is speaking in our language now which means the conversation is over. When Aunt Fostalina switches languages like that, you know whatever was being talked about is finished. Now the TV screen is split into two, and there's two pictures of the woman. A before one, when she was bigger and looked like a real person, and an after one, where she is thin and looks like a beautiful thing. Give me that phone, then go to my room and bring my blue purse. I need to order this push-up, Aunt Fostalina says. <laughs> Upstairs, I look out the window of Aunt Fostalina's bedroom at the cemetery across the road. The first thing you notice is all those decorations, like they are maybe trying to tell you that death is beautiful. 
At the entrance is a large concrete thingy with letters in a language I don't know, on top of which lies a big sculpture of a reclining woman, her head resting to the side. She is covering her face with one hand as if to say there's too much sun in life, as if to say she doesn't want to be disturbed. All over the cemetery are beautiful sculptures of angels, an angel looking at the sky, an angel asleep on a stone slave, an angel carrying a dove, an angel with a hand on the heart, an angel kneeling in front of a fountain. Looking at them like that, you would think that angels are common things that run around the place in real life, like cats and dogs and cockroaches and cars. The graveyard itself is covered in green grass, and all over are trees that cast long shadows in the day. And then there are the tombstones. Some look like little houses, some look like castles, some, look, some just look strange, but they are all interesting. Whenever I look at the cemetery, I always think of Father lying at Heavenway where they buried him. His grave nothing but a mound of red earth, and I almost wish that he too were buried somewhere beautiful, where you can see why it is that when they bury the dead, they say, rest in peace. When we moved here from Detroit I and I first saw the cemetery, I didn't even know it was a place of the dead. I just thought it was a museum of something, another interesting place where interesting things happened. The road that divides our house from the cemetery is a smooth belt. And I always wonder what exactly, it, I always wonder where exactly it would end if I followed it. In America, roads are like the devil's hands, like God's love, reaching all over. Just the sad thing is, they won't really take me home. There are two homes inside my head. Home before paradise and home in paradise. Home one and home two. Home one was best a real house, father and mother having good jobs, plenty of food to eat, clothes to wear, radios blaring every Saturday and everybody dancing because there was nothing to do but party and be happy. And then home too, paradise, with his tin, tin, tin. There are three homes inside mothers and Aunt Fostalina's heads. Home before independence, before I was born, when black people and white people were fighting over the country. Home after independence, when black people won the country, and then the home of things falling apart, which made Anne Fostalina leave and come here. Home one, home two, and home three. There are four homes inside Mother of Bones's head. Home before the white people came to steal the country and a king ruled. Home when the white people came to steal the country and then there was war. Home when the black people got our stolen country back after independence and then the home of now. Home one, home two, home three, home four. When somebody talks about home, you have to listen carefully so you know exactly which one the person is referring to. Two days ago, the president of our country came on TV during the BBC news. He was raising his fists and speaking, saying how our country is a black man's home and would never be a colony again and what not. Anfostalina snatched the remote control from the coffee table, pointed it at the TV like it was a gun and shot. We all turned to look at her sitting there shaking. TK, who is no longer a fat boy because he started lifting weights and now looks like Will Smith in Ali, started to laugh but then he stopped himself, maybe because of the look on Anne Fostalina's face. Uncle Kojo grabbed the remote and changed the channel back. Anne Fostalina glared at him for a while, then got up and left the room without saying anything. On TV, the president said, just after Anne Fostalina left, as if he were telling a secret and he had been waiting for Aunt Fostalina to leave before he could say it. We don't mind sanctions banning us from Europe. We are not Europeans. And Uncle Kojo threw his fists in the air and pumped them real hard. Then he saluted the TV and shouted, 
tell them, Mr. President, tell these bloody colonists. Then he was grinning, looking first at TK and then at me. That there boys is the only motherfucker with balls on our continent. Africa's leading statesman, he said. Me and TK looked at each other, puzzled. Then we smiled, and then we exploded in laughter because it was the first time that we heard agriculture using that word, and so it sounded interesting and beautiful. <laughs> TK was still laughing when he left the living room and went up the stairs. Later, when I got onto Facebook, he had told the story there, and there were so many likes and LOLs on his wall. I'm drinking my third Capri Sun now, and my stomach is so full of guava and liquid, it could burst. Aunt Fostalina is busy trying to order a push-up bra on the phone, and you can tell that she and whoever she is speaking to are having issues. <laughs> the problem with English is this. You usually can't open your mouth and it comes out just like that. First, you have to think what you want to say. Then you have to find the words. Then you have to carefully arrange those words inside your head. Then you have to say the words quietly to yourself to make sure you got them okay. And finally, the last step, which is to say the words out loud and have them sound just right. But because you have to do all this, when you get to the final step, something strange has happened to you and you speak the way a drunk walks. And because you are speaking like falling, it's as if you are an idiot, when the truth is that it's the language and the whole process that's messed up. And the problem with those who speak only English is this. They don't know how to listen. They are busy looking at your falling instead of paying attention to what you are saying. I have decided the best way to deal with it all to deal with it all is to sound American, and the TV has told me just how to do it. It's pretty easy. All you have to do is watch Dora the Explorer, <laughs> The Simpsons, SpongeBob, Scooby-Doo, and then you move on to That's So Raven, Glee, Friends, Golden Girls, and so on, just listening and imitating the accents. If you do it well, then before you know it, nobody will ask you to repeat what you said. I also have my list of American words that I keep under the tongue like talismans ready to use. Pretty good, for real, awesome, totally, skinny, dude, freaking, bizarre, psyched, messed up, tripping, you are welcome, acting up, yikes. The TV has also told me that if I'm talking to someone, I have to look him in the eye, even if it is an adult, even if it's rude. I don't know why Anne Fostalina doesn't think to learn American speech like this, seeing how it would make her life easier so she wouldn't have a hard time like she is right now. I said the angel collection, Anne Fostalina is saying. She has muted the TV and raised the volume on the handset so I can hear the other person as well. She sounds like a bored young girl. I'm sorry, what? I mean, I didn't quite hear that. Maybe it's my line. Excuse me. I can picture her head cogged, the young girl. A smile, a, a frown of concentration on her face. Angel, 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 and Fostalina says, raising her voice even louder. There is silence, like maybe the girl is getting ready to pray. Angel, and Fostalina adds helpfully, dragging out the word like she's raking gravel. I silently mouth, Angel. I hear the girl make a small sigh. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean, ma'am, she says, finally. You can tell from her voice that she's getting tired from trying to understand. What do you mean you don't know what I mean? 
you don't understand what I'm saying, such a simple word, Anfostalina says. She is speaking with her hands now, and I can tell from her face that if the girl doesn't get it soon, it's not going to be good. <laughs> I clear my throat to remind Anfostalina that I'm in the room, so maybe she will ask me to speak for her, but she doesn't. Now she has scribbled the word angel all over the magazine, and the naked woman with the bra and underways all clothed in black ink, the letters like tiny angry insects. Ma'am, I'm terribly sorry we're having these difficulties, but we have a website that you can order from. The girl on the phone says, her voice lifting. You can tell that she is pleased with the fact that she has thought of the website, that things are going to work out after all. I am relieved as well, and I start thinking maybe I should run upstairs and grab my MacBook for Aunt Fostalina to use. I get up from the couch. No, I am not ordering online, Aunt Fostalina says, firmly, separating her words now, which is never a good thing. I sit back down. She pokes the Victoria's Secret woman's face with a pen as she says each word. I am not ordering online. I am speaking in English, so as far as I'm concerned, maybe you can spell it. The girl sounds like she is getting annoyed, like maybe she is saying some serious insults inside her head that she can't say out loud. Now you want me to spell it, and Fostalina says. She looks at me like she can't believe what she is hearing, but I look away at the TV. The woman is gone. There's a new one sitting on an exercise ball. I'm waiting for one for Stalina to tell the girl on the phone off, because that's what she sounds like she's getting ready to do, but something changes her mind, and she sits up and starts to spell. It's A, and for Stalina says. Her voice is a bit calmer. She has written the letter on the magazine, as if to be sure. OK, A is in Apple. Not apple, A as in anus, it's a different sound. N as in no, G as in God, E as in it, L as in Libya, there you go, angel, 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 and for Stalina says. There is a brief silence, like maybe the girl is considering what she has written. And then she says, oh, you mean angel? Yes, angel. That's what I was trying to tell you all this time. I want a red one, and Fostalina says, rolling her R. The sound of it like something is vibrating inside her mouth, and I promise myself I'll never sound like that. When Aunt Fostalina gets off the phone with the Victoria's Secret Lady, she dials a number that must be busy because she quickly hangs up. She dials another, <laughs> and she has to hold for a little while before I hear her leave a message in our language for the other person to call her back. I know the reason Aunt Fostalina is calling is that she needs to tell the Victoria's Secret story to someone in our language, because this is what you must do in America whenever something like this happens. You have to tell it to someone who knows what you mean who will understand exactly what you say, and that it is not your fault, but the other person's. Someone who knows that English is like a huge iron door, and you are always losing the keys. After leaving her message, Aunt Fostalina just sits there, as if something important is happening inside her, and she is waiting for it to come out. She also has this look, I have seen it many times before, but I still don't know whether to call it pain or anger or sadness or whether it has a name. I am careful not to meet her eyes as she puts her card back in her purse and then gets up, walks downstairs to the basement and slams the door shut behind her. I know that she will turn on the lights as she descends the creaking stairway that she will take small measured steps like there is something down there that she dreads. That when she gets to the bottom, 
she will stand in front of the mirror that covers one wall and look at her reflection. I know that she won't be looking at her thinness, but at her mouth. I know that she will stand there and start the conversation all over and say out loud, in careful English, all the things that she meant to say, that she should have said to the girl on the phone, but did not because she could not find the words at the time. I know that in front of that mirror, and for Stalina will be articulate. That English will come alive on her tongue, and she will spit it like it's burning her mouth, like it's poison, like it's the only language she has ever known. Thank you. My question is actually a request. I'd love to hear you say your own name in your own language. My own name in my own language. Yes. How does it sound? <laughs> uh, it's act the, the name that's in my language is actually different. It's Zandile. Zandile. Uh, my sister was sitting next to you. Her name is Zanele. Quite interesting because they almost sound the same. I, I think my our father was fed up of girls. <laughs> so it was his own prayer for a boy child. So, yeah. No, Bulawa is, is pronounced with a silent B. Bulawa, you find, no, Violet is an English uh, name. That's our mother's name. She, she passed away when I was 18 months. And uh, she was not spoken about, so I, I just wanted to honor her memory by, by using her name. So that's the story of it. Right. I have a question from the from a portion of the book where you talked about um, Mountains, horses, and riding through skyscrapers. Like I can get it. It's it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's uh, trying to. See. It's actually from one of my favorite sections of the book, but that's that's what happens when language tries to be poetic and tries to do fancy gymnastics. Sometimes uh, readers kind of miss that. But I was, I think I was speaking again to the issue of using your own language, that uh, these immigrants are struggling with English. When they are using English, they don't feel like they are real selves. Uh, meaning is not lost, I mean, meaning is lost. They say things that they did not mean to say. But with their own language, they, are, they feel like they are galloping past skyscrapers. So it's, it's a state of being that comes from using your own language. I really loved how you captured the tension that Paradise felt when she got to Michigan with her friends when she had them in her heart, but then when she spoke to them on the phone and, and that distancing that she felt both emotionally, the closeness and the distancing. And I was wondering how old you were when you moved here and how, um, I, I mean, I think that's a, a you know, such a, an immigrant experience of living in these two worlds and yet not mm -hmm. quite feeling like you're in either, and I just wanted you to speak to that. Um, I moved here, I, I was significantly older than Darling. She moves when she's around 10, I moved when I was 18. Um, I came for college. But still, 18 is a tricky age. Um, you know, we are a teenager and we are expected to fit in. Uh, it, it, it was quite challenging for me. It's a, it's a very different culture, so I had to find myself navigating a terrain that I was brought up by a strict father. So things like dating, for example, and speaking certain, uh, certain kinds of, of languages and what things that kids here do for fun were sort of very new and strange for me. So I was almost always outside uh, at the margins. And then when I started going to college, the culture shock was uh, an issue for me. And interestingly, in as much as I was, uh, our instruction was in English, for half the time I didn't know what my teachers were saying in class. So I, I was a quiet kid sitting at the back, um, but of course I did fine in, in my exams. So it, it was that, you know, darling in, in the US is very much informed by my own 
uh, by my own experience and struggles with, with fitting in. Mm -hmm. I want to say I identified you with you because when I first came here, I thought I was speaking English. <laughs> 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 but the other thing I wanted to ask was how autobiographical your work is, this particular story. Um, the, the, the part that happens in Zimbabwe is really not, we don't have uh, anything in common with Darling because I grew up in a country, I was born right after independence, so I grew up, I had a very, very beautiful and normal childhood. Whereas Darling and the generation that's, that came up, came of age when the country was falling apart, uh, faced challenges. You know, simple things like power cuts didn't happen when I was growing up. Um, and, you know, they, their childhood is very different. But when it comes to the U.S., our stories start, start to intersect because I was writing from the immigrant perspective and I was consciously um, doing that. But I did not watch porn <laughs> <laughs> that much. <laughs> Uh, it's quite interesting because I, I didn't go to visit Zim until after the book was published. And I, I was in the U.S. for 13 years before I was able to go back home. So it was mostly my imagination um, at work. I was, I was fortunate that I was working at a time when communication was easier. There was, you know, you have we could call people, Skype, email, and whatnot. So I was interested in my, in my young nieces and nephews. Some of them I'd never met. They were born after I, I, I had left. But I was talking to them and trying to figure out what they sounded like, what kinds of things they were into. Um, but that said, I had to also go back to my own childhood for the voice to remember what I sounded like at 10. And I tapped into my uh, close friends as well, the kinds of friendships and the kind of uh, games we, we played. But things like Facebook also helped because I could get on there and see things happening at home that I would not have dreamed. So. Mm -hmm. well, I, it's not like a question, but I'll tell you, like, surprised how you could get into different like people and personalities, and just I don't know how to do it, and uh, you know. Somehow you made Nigerians look bad, you know, Nigerians. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I make you look bad. I just wanted to find out, like, how, how do you, like, sit down and create all these things? Because at the time I was thinking that you were actually Dolly, like, like the real Dolly, like, something like that. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Like, maybe you know, that was exactly your past and... You know, I'm kind of surprised you said you lived a different life set when you were much younger. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to find out, like, how do you come up with such creative ideas? Um, Jesus, that's a hard one because you don't, I don't consciously, it just happens. But again, that doesn't answer the question. I think part of being a, a creative person, uh, that's what you do and your training starts, you know, for me it started formally when I, decide when I took my first creative writing class and I realized that that's what I wanted to do. So I started telling stories and reading. Reading was a big part of it because you see how other worlds are created and you start thinking um, along those lines. But I was also brought up by storytellers. Um, my grandmother set us around the fire every night when we were in the village and bombarded us with stories, whether we wanted to hear them or not. <laughs> but it, it was also the only entertainment. We didn't have a TV, and um, we also didn't have a TV in my city home until I was 18, when I, until I was leaving. So stories for me were like a, a currency, you know. Um, and our playgrounds, is when we were kids, kind of mimicked the, 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 the story world that we heard from our grandmothers and, 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 and elders. And of course, when I started consciously working at, as an artist, it's all about creating stuff and trying to 
give the reader the sensation that whatever they are reading is, is real. Um, it's my first book. I don't think I'm there yet, but it's, 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 I think I'm, I'm still a work in progress. So. <laughs> I personally think the book ended a bit abruptly. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I've always been wondering what happens to TK that doesn't die, or, 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 or did you just say he needed to be left there or something? Do you have a sequel in mind? Or? <laughs> <laughs> um, where, where darling is concerned, yes, I do, because the, the story ends when she's just starting college. Um, you know, but I don't see myself writing it anytime soon. I'm I'm still worn out by the, the, the first attempt. <laughs> so, but but stories are never really completed. I think, um, you know, threads like T K S and other, because I've had readers interested in Bastard and other characters. But I'm like, you know, their stories will go on and on. Um, but I think I'll be the kind of writer who comes. I've already started coming back to my characters on my blog or in short, um, in, sh in shorter forms. So I, I think I'll be working on it for, for a while longer. <laughs> I have a question um, on behalf of my students who are reading your book right now. And today they were talking about it in class and they said, you know, why do you think, why do you think she has this scene with the porn? Sorry, we keep mentioning the porn. Uh -huh. and, um, <laughs> I said, I don't know, but I'll ask her. So I asked her for my 16-year-old uh, female students uh, who were curious um, uh -huh. if, if we were supposed to read anything into it or just why it was there. Why was it? I'm surprised 16 year olds are asking why they. <laughs> uh, it's a girl's school. I was trying. Um, this, the way we read Darling when she's in Zimbabwe, we read her through the kinds of, of challenges that uh, kids there face at the time. So I wanted to, to look at what kids in America are doing, you know, and the, 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 sep the separate and unique dangers that, that um, a, a, a teen would face this side. And for me, porn just came, you know, she was at the forefront of those things that I know teenagers do. So it's a conversation, it's a cultural conversation between two spaces. But I, I, I've, I, I've, I've been going home quite um, often now, and I think it's, kids are doing it too there, so. <laughs> How difficult was it to get published? How difficult? Um, How did you go about it? Yeah, I think the, that one is an easier question for me. I I went through, I, I found an agent, which is like the traditional, I think it's the traditional uh, way to go about it. You write your thing and you find an agent who then finds a, a publisher. But I, I, I was lucky that one of my mentors at Cornell, where I did my MFA, was uh, sort of emphasized this, this, this thing of writing and doing all you can before you even started thinking of showing the book. So I, I really you know, took the extra time to sort of get the book in as perfect a shape as I, I could possibly get because I, I, she made me understand that you know, once your writing is in that um, good spot, then it's easier for an edit, uh, for an agent or whatever to to come in. So I, uh, I think it took me an ex. I, I took a year because I, I I tried to query, and then I got rejections. Like I think, it happens with with most writers. But I think I deserve them at the time. Um, then it it sort of encouraged me to go back to the to the studio and keep working. And when I tried a year later. It was it it went very very smoothly. Um, so as a writer, I try to be. Um, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. How do you keep on going to write a full novel? I tried to write a novel. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually managed to finish it, but somewhere along the lines, like in the middle of the book, especially when it's fiction, mm -hmm. like you kind of get writer's block or like 
But how do you know when your next scene is going to come? Like, how do you just finish the novel? <laughs> It's hard. I think it's the novel will try its best to not be finished. So, <laughs> for me, one of the things I, I did was give myself a schedule that forced me to be working every, every day. I well, I, I was living in Ithaca. There was nothing to do there. So, <laughs> I I went to bed nine thirty ten. I was in bed five thirty. I was up. So having to confront the thing every day sort of made it alive and it kept, I was able to keep going. And when it came to writer's block, um, I read or simply showed it to, again, I had a writing community so I could show it to people who would sort of help me figure, um, figure things out. So sometimes it just needs to be one, one reader that you trust, but you, you, you have to find a way to, to keep moving. I, I hope you are able to go back to it Yeah. Uh, so it's your book, so I know you, you know you love the whole book. But uh, if you were to say uh, your favorite chapter or part of the book, which uh, if you have one, which would it be? Um, it it would have to be how how they lived. The section that the, the gentleman to your right was referring to with the uh, skyscrapers, um, and it's my favorite because it's a it's a section where I. <coughs> where I collect, I try to collect uh, all of America's uh, immigrants in that one section. Because when I was writing the immigrant story, and for me, just being an immigrant and hanging out with young immigrants, I realized that somewhere along the way, we had the exact same story, <coughs> regardless of where, uh, of where we came from, that we all knew something about living and getting here and trying to deal with the new space. So that, that's a section that really speaks to me. Just checking in with you. Uh, are two more questions, is that good? Or no, it's how? fine, it's fine. You're okay with Yeah, okay, I, I, like, I like talking the mic. Like we're gonna keep you all night if you're willing. No, it's, 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 I did okay. it to myself by writing the book, so. <laughs> Michigan. Oh. And my grandparents came here from Germany. And there's a lot of interesting immigrant groups throughout mm -hmm. Michigan. I just wondered what made you decide to select that and if you had any connection there and if it was more of, a, again, kind of a composite mm -hmm. of other places. Um, Kalamazoo is my home away from home. I. <coughs> My aunt lives there. I have two sisters who live there and nieces. And I went to Kalamazoo Valley Community College. I don't know if you know where that's at. And that's where I started, uh, took my first creative writing class. So it's, it's a space that kind of feels intimate for me. So it was natural that I, 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 I make it the heart of my American part of the book. Yeah, I still go there and I, and I love it. Actually, one of my sisters called me yesterday. She's a nurse, she's a wound nurse, so she makes house calls. So I get this phone at a, a 7 a.m. in the morning, which is not a good time for me. And she's like, well, I'm here with my patient and she wants to talk to you. She has read the book, so. <laughs> <laughs> words and language played a lot of, like, a large role in the story, so I was wondering, and names too, so I was wondering why you named it, you named it names, like, what the significance of names and words are Um, we need new names. I, I wrote it at a time that we now know in Zimbabwe, we call it the lost decade, because it's a time when things fall apart, fell apart due to failure of leadership, so the country just didn't go where it needed to go. Um, so on that note, it was my way of saying we needed new leadership, we needed new ways of looking at ourselves and new ways of imagining our, our destinies. So that's what I was trying to do there. I have a very different kind of question. Okay. I'd like you to just speak very briefly to the political situation. You've been home, you said that the things were not as bad 
in a certain period when you were growing up and where you were growing up, but then uh, you, the, the wars began. How are things looking to you? I, I know you can't take a lot of time, but just mm -hmm. briefly, as someone who has the experience. I, I, I missed. I, I miss the part of the bad parts in the sense that I was born right after independence. So I missed the two decade war, almost two decade war from 65 to 1980. Um, from 1980 to roughly around 2000, the, the country was fairly stable. And I think we're known as one of the, the, the bread basket of Africa. I think that speaks to where we were economically. Um, our education system was actually one of the best in Africa. Sorry to break, I know the Africans in here. <laughs> but Zimbabwe was the best in terms of uh, our education and literacy right now. But 2000, things just started to, to go downhill and they were compounded by failure of, of leadership. And uh, for the first time, Part of our problem is that we don't have a healthy culture of opposition parties. We're just comfortable with one party that came in power after independence. So when, when things started going downhill, um, that, that translated to, I mean, at around 2005 going up, our inflation was the highest, for example. Um, kids, in terms of school, school teachers were leaving to get better jobs in South Africa, Botswana, neighboring countries. More than 90% of the population was not employed. So it, it I mean, it, it gave rise to a, a, this, you know, the, the, at least the most compelling political uh, opposition party known as the MTC. And when we had our elections in 2008, um, it was projected that the MTC was going to come into power. But unfortunately, our government rigged it, it you know, because exit polls projected that the MTC was going, going to come into power and then we had a runoff. And the government used a combination of intimidation and violence to hold on to power. And in the end, it did hold on to power. But that did not make things um, better. Now it's stable. I mean, I just went home again after another election last year, I think. But this one, people just didn't go to vote, mostly because they felt like it, it, it was not going to count because they had been screwed in the earlier election. We're using the US dollar, so there is a little bit of stability, but the majority of the people can't get their hands on it. So we are really far from where we need to be given our potential. But um, I think when you talk to people on the ground, they will tell you that they are fine as long as they are living, you know, which is said in the sense that we are, we are circling, you know, as long as we are alive and people are living their lives. But the reality is that we could be, we could be better. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering as a young woman, how you were encouraged or supported by your family or community to go to college and um, I, I already had family in Michigan. I think our aunt came here like maybe 40 years ago to be a nurse. So she kind of took care of some of her nieces and nephews, made it possible for us to come. So I came in that way, but I came to study law and not be a writer. So that was my only little thing that I did at the side. And I mostly kept it to myself because I come from a culture where parents want you to do sensible things in school, you know, <laughs> law, engineering, medicine, or whatnot. Um, and also, I also didn't know where it was going to be. Writing is one of those things, uh, especially when you are starting out, there's no measure. So I, uh, it was mostly an act of faith. Um, but my, my, my sister was supportive, the one who's sitting here. <laughs> uh, she moved to Dallas, for example, so that I didn't have to <coughs> struggle trying to make it work. But now that I have something to show them and say, okay, this is you know, what I do, they are, they are quite happy with the product. So yeah, it's, I, I think most, most young artists sometimes from other, you know, it's, it's not always easy. I don't think mine is a unique story in that way, but um, it's hard to be an artist, period. I'm wondering if you would tell us, has the internet made it to Zimbabwe and what impact is that having on the society there? 
Um, yes, the, in, the internet has made it all over. And um, I, I saw the impact in this lost decade in the sense that we were able to keep in touch, connected, follow things that were ho happening at home. Um, and uh, the younger generation, I was, I was just there and, you know, people want iPads and computers and whatnot because they want to be part of, of, of this larger this larger space. So it's, it's, it's positive. It's not everywhere in the rural areas, for example, it's hard. And people in the cities mostly access it through internet uh, shops and work and school. Not everybody has it at home, but I think hopefully the, the technology uh, revolution will get to a point where everybody has it at home, and I think that would be a good, a good thing. I, I haven't had the pleasure yet of reading your book, but I, I, I will be soon. So. Thank you. You know, today was the election in South Africa, and a lot has been written about the difference in attitude between the born frees and, and, and their parents mm -hmm. in terms of voting in terms of, you know, the opportunities they had and how they view the country and the political system. Mm -hmm. At least three times, you know, you've re referred to the fact that you were born yeah. post-1988. Could you talk about something that you sort of addressed somewhat in, in that one scene when they were watching the Guardian TV mm -hmm. about potential differences in attitude between the generations and how, how they view things? Um, is, there, is there a similar... Sort of yeah, absolutely. In what ways this appears to be in South Africa, or at least is written down in South Africa. Yeah, um, I, I think most of Mugabe's support is going to come from the older generation because they will always view him as a freedom fighter, uh, somebody who fought hard to, to win the country and led it um, right after the end of British colonial rule. Whereas the born free generation doesn't quite have that kind of allegiance because we're not there during the war, for example. And uh, we grew up in a very different space with different challenges. So we are more comfortable holding our leadership accountable because that's who we see in power, you know. So when the majority is living without electricity and water cars, we we just point to our our government, whereas it, it can be difficult for the for the older generation. That said, we are also a generation that has mobility in ways that the older generation does not. So that um, brilliant kids in universities now will feel like, well, I'm just gonna go and study abroad, get a scholarship and study abroad. And I think that short changes us in the sense that we have this brain drain you know people who would otherwise have a transformative impact in the country living not not always because they want to but because the environment doesn't make them make it uh, possible for them to stay but then in their living there is a gap that will never ever be filled so it's it's, it's you know it's a it's a difficult situation to be in and it's something that i have I think about in terms of, um, yeah, you have gotten your education, are you going to go back home and, you know, yeah. Uh, there's certainly been a raging debate about immigration in the U.S. And what are your personal observations about the situation today? Wow, that's, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, obviously, as an immigrant, I am always going to be pro-immigration and opening uh, borders and, and letting people come in. But uh, that, that, that is my stance, really, yeah. Okay, uh, our final question of the night, okay. <laughs> then we can go. I wondered if you could share who you read for inspiration. Who I read? I read uh, Chino Diaz, I read uh, Shumpa Lahiri, Tony Morrison, Edward P. Jones, Colima, Columa Ken, Hemingway, Faulkner. It's, it's a long, long list. I was an English major, so <laughs> I was I was force fed books and books, but it's, it's yeah, yeah. It's, it's a rich time to be creating and reading because all sorts of amazing writers are, yeah.
Thank you. Thank you.